people get stirred up more. I hope they, I hope they shout. I hope they exercise their own freedom of speech because they can't actually put us all away. As uh, Etienne de la Boetie, the great French political thinker of the of the 16th century, that Murray Rothbard brought back, said, pointed out, of course, the rulers are always a tiny minority as compared to the ruled. And if we we actually don't have to let them get away with things, that if anybody just puts Boetti, B O E T I E, and Rothbard into LouRockwell.com, Google search engine there, you come up with uh, de la Boetie's magnificent essay, which could be written today on this course on voluntary servitude. Because he says the political theorists at the time, and I guess maybe all time, are constantly focused on how do they make sure that everybody believes in and obeys the king, the government. But he says to him, the question is, why the heck does anybody? What is in it for anybody to do it? So he, Murray Rothbard's uh, long introduction to that to that monograph, which is one of the great things Murray ever wrote, to me it's, it's like the blueprint for how we can actually overthrow a tyrannical government without violence. We don't need violence. We can't. Of course, violence is the government's weapon. It's the one with the death squads and the armies and the atomic bombs and so forth. I think it's morally and from a from utilitarian standpoint, uh, this is not something for us to use. But there are other methods. But his essay is one great uh, clarion call for a nonviolent way to get rid of a tyrannical government. I, maybe that's a... Uh, I'm repeating myself that a tyrannical government because it was government itself is tyrannical. I think one of the things you've done, Lou, that is very important is keeping the writings of Murray Rothbard alive. Now, you knew Murray personally. How did you get to know him and what was he like? Well, I, I got to know him first because a uh, publishing house I worked for, Arlington House Publishers, which uh, under the uh, uh, aegis of a great businessman, a great editor, a uh, great entrepreneur, Neil McCaffrey, the late Neil McCaffrey. And this was the publisher also of Mises. It's how I got to be Mises' editorial assistant at, 20, at the age of 24, so a very great thing. <laughs> so I knew Murray a little bit because we, he published Conceived in Liberty. I didn't have the, the honor to be his editor at that point. But then I got to know him much better later 70s and early 80s. And when I started the Mises Institute, the first person whose permission I asked was Margaret von Mises, my widow. And then the second person I asked was Murray and asked if he'd be in charge of academic affairs. And of course, the Institute at that time was just a letterhead, right? But Murray was extremely enthusiastic. He actually clapped his hands with glee. I mean, it, it, that was really? the kind of guy he was. The idea that yeah. there would be an institute devoted to the work and to the person of uh, his great teacher. What can I say about Murray? Besides being, of course, a, a, a world historic genius, he was a great guy. When I knew Mises, even though he was probably slightly past his high point, uh, and went a little bit in decline, but still extremely beautiful manners, uh, beautifully dressed, beautifully, extremely dignified, very well spoken. I mean, just a uh, Murray said to somebody who was a, clearly a representative of an older and better age. So that, that was Mises. But I didn't really, I knew Margaret on Mises much, much better. I, I didn't really know Mises much at all, except to have, to have uh, met him and talked to him on the phone and corresponded with him. Murray, I, I knew very, very well. And there's nobody who's the greater, in my experience, a greater guy. I mean, nobody you'd rather have a drink with, nobody you'd rather talk with. Whenever he was in the room, he was just immediately surrounded. And one reason was he was so hilarious. He was like a stand-up comic. I mean, you weren't in his presence for more than two or three minutes before you were laughing out loud. I mean, he was right. it's just so funny. Yeah, I, I had the opportunity to meet him only two or three times, but it's really hard to describe Murray Rothbard because there's really no one you can point to and say, well, he's sort of like this guy or like that guy. I mean, he was a very, very unique individual, obviously very sharp, but had insights on almost everything going on at the world at a time and sort of put it in a humorous way on top of it. I mean, it was just an incredible guy that way. Well, I remember uh, talking to a young man who was a Cambodian expert for one of the think tanks in, in Washington, D.C., and had ridden in a cab to an institute event with Murray. And when Murray found out what he did, he said later that cab ride, he felt like his brain had been vacuumed. <laughs> he said because turned yeah. out that Murray knew everything about Cambodia and, of course, wanted to know yeah. everything more that he could find out. And Yuri Maltsev, economics professor today, at that point was a defector from Russia. When Murray was talking to him, he said it turned out that Murray knew far more about Russian economics than he did and knew all kinds of early proto-free market people and who are Russian economists that Yuri never heard of. Or if we're talking about, say, ethnic clashes, and I uh, remember once this coming up when the clash of Abkhazia and, and South Ossetia, long before when these were all still parts of the Soviet Union, and he uh, knew everything about every group 
who they were allied with, the language issues, the cultural issues, the, all of course the political issues. Also, he was a huge sports fan. So when the Olympics came up, you know, not only did he watch in the Olympics, and he loved of course, certain sports more than others, but he knew who were the record holders. He knew all about the previous athletes who'd done well in that particular sport. He knew the history of the sport. He was like an expert on the Olympics, and he was a big college basketball fan. He knew everything about college basketball. I mean, he could have been a professional basketball broadcaster or something. I mean, he had that that kind of knowledge, and you know, he he knew every. You couldn't actually, you couldn't believe. Also, combined with it with a with a certain humility. I mean, he he was not the kind of guy like uh, some people who go around saying, "Let me show you how smart I am." You know, you, right, right. he never. Uh, he was never like that, and he was always interested in finding a spark of something worthwhile in the other person and fanning that spark. He was always mm-hmm. looking for uh, anybody who might be a, con- a contributor to the cause of liberty. Quite, he was, I mean, of course, like you, I've never known anybody, uh, anything to approach him. Yeah, and, and on top of that, his knowledge of politics was incredible, and his enjoyment of politics, even though he, he's pretty much anti all politics he loved politics and if you were with him on uh, which only happened to me once i would always talk to him on the phone but on on uh, election night he'd have one of his long yellow legal pads typical of him filled with notes and he knew everything he knew who were the candidates in a particular congressional district uh, what the issues were who was likely going to win he knew in the senate races the gubernatorial races of course the presidential stuff he knew everything you look at his books. How did he know all this? Tom Woods recently pointed out when he looked at the Conceived in Liberty, he said this is an area of specialty for him, Tom Woods, and he's looking at these books and he's like, where, where, how did Rothbard find out about all this stuff I've never heard of? And if you look at his books, you alone, you you wonder how did somebody have time to grasp the knowledge to write all these? It, it seems like he's enjoying himself watching politics and sports and all that kind of thing. Maybe you can tell me if this is true or not. He used to, there was a soap opera he used to watch in the middle of the day or something. He I loved mean, soap they, operas. And, you know, I, 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 was it As the World Turns? I can't remember now which one it was. Right. But he, uh, that was his relaxation. Of course, I mean, sports were his, politics were his relaxation. And uh, some people said that uh, the Koch people especially dismissed all and said, well, he's not really a scholar. Yet he worked, of course, a very disciplined day. Uh, he wrote many hours a day, read many hours a day, thought many hours. I mean, he was just so he had the kind of mind. I don't know what is that. What what was it about his IQ? Been two hundred or two twenty or something? He uh, he had true? the he had the ability to just know. You know, he's like a universal genius. We were very lucky to have him. Now I read somewhere that you would wake up in the morning. This is pre-internet, where you would go to your fax machine and, and you would get pages and pages of. <laughs> Yes. Comments and writing from us? Yeah, this is this is of course in addition to all his scholarly writing, his teaching, his reading, uh, and and all his hobbies and so forth. He wrote a huge amount for the newsletter that he and I did. And so I yes, it would I would just pop out of bed to go see what was in the fax machine, and there would be a twenty or twenty five page article on something that he'd written overnight. <laughs> and of course, just fascinating. And a lot of these are collected in the book called The Irrepressible Rothbard. And The Irrepressible Rothbard, which is a big thick book of about 500 pages, and it's less than a quarter of what he wrote for this newsletter. This was just one outlet at one small time in his life. So if we were ever to do a collected works of Rothbard, take up you know some gigantic room in a library, there's no telling how many thousands and thousands of articles he wrote. That's including, and then of course, books, chapters and books, essays. And then of course, his personal correspondences, which apparently, I mean, he would go on from time to time. Robert Higgs talks about how he commented on one of his papers and would go on for Pages and pages. You know, I think this is such a great story, and it says a lot about the greatness of Robert Higgs as well as about the greatness of Murray Rothbard. That when Bob sent him the manuscript for what became Crisis and Leviathan, that Murray sent him back, I believe it was a 22 page single spaced letter, uh, loving the book and saying, Hey, Bob, you might want to look into these things. And the typical academic's response to this is, Well, how dare, you know, he. Bob's response was, Holy smokes, and he took a year to go through all the stuff that read everything Murray recommended and redid his book in, in light of it. Wow. Uh, but, but Murray had that kind of that kind of ability. And if you look at the memos that he did for the Volcker Fund, libertarian foundation that he worked for when he couldn't get a job before and, and after getting his, his PhD, he did these fantastic memos for them on books and important journal articles and so forth that are just, just extraordinary. And also David Gordon is going to be doing a an edited version of his correspondence. One of the great letter writers ever. 
I mean, when you see when you see his letters, he should be famous just for the letters he wrote. Forget everything else. So he wrote wow. thousands and thousands of letters. They're so interesting, so full of fascinating stuff, fascinating analysis, funny. I don't know quite how many volumes there are potentially of, of letters, but uh, uh, David's working on that's going to be another great another great uh, piece of Rothbardiana. You know, on those memos, his incredible knowledge, uh, the, the spectrum was in, in reading those was, was awesome in the David Gordon uh, edited uh, book that came out. Murray being the great scholar he was, this is the ideal when you've got somebody like this, kept everything. So we've got, mm-hmm. for example, in our archives, uh, the papers he wrote in the fourth grade. And when you read really? his when you read his schoolwork, even in grammar school, it's recognizably Murray Rothbard. Now, how is that? Really? I don't know. But I mean, we've really? got yeah, it's 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 quite quite something. I remember an old old friend of his, Bill White, who had known him in grammar school, uh, telling me that his mother coming home from school one day and and saying, "Why can't you be like that Murray Rothbard?" You know, I got. Scolded by the <laughs> by the principal because of X Y Z and said uh, Murray Rothbard. He said he said in my entire career he said I've never encountered a student like this and this is again in grammar school. So I think Murray was clearly something very unusual right away and his parents uh, realized it and they took him out of uh, public school and put him into into private school which is where Bill Bill White was uh, in, in school too. You know he was he was magical and so sweet. Wow. I mean such a sweet guy too. I mean right. not not a not envious not. Not arrogant, but on the other hand, entirely stuck on principle. I mean, when is it, when is it a matter right. of principle of right and wrong? He was immovable. On the other hand, he learned, right? He changed his mind sometimes. So he wasn't he wasn't a stick in the mud. Nobody liked him. And of course, I think it's so interesting. And Tom Woods gave a recent uh, wonderful talk on this at, at, at Mises University about all the people who hate Rothbard, because of course, there's this, all the people who are either on the Coke payroll or who would like to be on the Coke payroll. Part of the oath you have to swear is you have to hate the guts of Murray Rothbard and diminish him. Now, of course, there was a time when they, for example, in the seminars at the Cato Institute, when they um, there would be like a lecture on pay no attention to Rothbard. They got away with this for a time just because people admire power and money or are in awe of it. Then they go along comes the Internet. And, of course, students tend to have a subversive streak in them anyway. So when if anybody is told, don't read Rothbard, well, what's the first thing the kid does when he gets back right. to his room, right. right? And, of course, you only have to... We try to have all of Murray's books and scholarly papers. We want to have eventually everything up there, his letters and, and all that. And you only have to read Rothbard to be pulled into him because he had to, in addition to everything else about him, he was just an extraordinary writer. I mean, he was just so clear, so so interesting, so persuasive and elegant and eloquent. I mean, just nobody liked him, uh, certainly not in economics. Milton Friedman was pretty good in his Newsweek columns, but uh, Henry Hazlitt, of course, was magnificent. But uh, Rothbard, there's a reason that Rothbard is so much a bigger figure today than when he was alive, because everything's up on the internet for free. People can read it, be influenced by it, are being influenced. So even though you have powerful figures saying, pay no attention to this guy, he's awful, he didn't like Charles Koch or whatever the other charges are, (laughs) <laughs> they can judge for themselves. Mm-hmm. By the way, right, Br- right. you had a, a neat item as it did I about uh, Bill Koch, former America's Cup racer and a sportsman, a very interesting guy uh, who's not political and who built a uh, uh, Wild West town out in Colorado, an entire town, uh, 55 buildings and uh, entirely for his family and his friends and to house his magnificent uh, museum quality collection of Western memorabilia, you know, uh, Wyatt Earp's gun and all that, <laughs> that sort of stuff. I thought, uh, and I think you made a similar comment, what a great way for a billionaire to spend his money rather than trying to run the rest of us through the government just to create something right. magnificent like this and enjoy it. And by the way, uh, Murray liked Bill Koch very much and Bill Koch liked Murray Rothbard. So the whole family is not anti-Murray, just the political. 